This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to another episode of Plain Talk Live. Uh, Governor Doug Burgum just signed into law a bill. It's House Bill 1503. I had to look and make sure I got the number right. House Bill 1503. Uh, and it's a campus free speech bill. Um, and it, it's it, that's an interesting debate because in the national news headlines, we hear a lot about um, problems with free speech on campus, whether it's uh, perhaps provocative or controversial campus speakers, uh, who are are protested? Maybe there's there's uh, administrations that put unreasonable like like security un, under the guise of of putting uh, unreasonable uh, like security fees on on an event and, and saying well we these are needed for security uh, might actually rise to the level of being censorious. You perhaps have other student groups that are interfering with um, with an event. I, there's just, there, there's a lot of issues, even in, in the classroom and, and frankly, even with faculty, perhaps, a uh, a professor or, or an instructor, uh, has written a controversial paper or has taken a controversial point of view or has made a, a provocative argument in, in, in a classroom setting or what have you. And, and, you know, people want to take action against that person. It's, it's, it's difficult. And so, North Dakota, obviously, we're a, we're a state that values higher education. In fact, uh, we tend to punch above our weight when it comes to funding higher education. We have 11 state, uh, for, for a state with about just over 700,000 people, we have 11 institutions of higher education. We are uh, routinely at or near the top when it comes to per capita spending on higher education. North Dakotans via, uh, value higher education a lot. So when it comes to free speech in the academic setting, in the higher education setting, it's an important debate for North Dakota. So anyway, one of the backers, one of the promoters of House Bill 1503, which again has passed both the House and the Senate uh, and has now been signed into law by Governor Doug Burgum, is the Foundation for Individual Rights in education. And here to speak with me a little bit about why this bill was important, why we needed it, is Tyler Coward. He is a attorney for FIRE. Tyler, how are you? Hi, uh, good morning. I'm well. How are you? I am doing just fine and uh, wanted to uh, talk with you about this bill. Tell us why, first of all, the, the state of, of free speech debate across the nation on, you know, w when it comes to higher education. I mean, this isn't this isn't just a North Dakota specific issue. Your organization is involved in these things across the country, these debates. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, first, why don't I uh, give your uh, viewers and listeners just a brief background about FIRE. Uh, FIRE is the Foundation for Individual Individual Rights in Education, and we are a uh, nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting uh, free speech and due process issues on college campuses nationwide. So we have we've we've been around since 1999, and we're really tr uh, very proud of our nonpartisan track record. If we uh, hear of a student or a faculty member who is censored or punished for speech that's protected by the First Amendment, uh, we roll up our sleeves and get to work on their behalf. And uh, if you look at our uh, at our uh, cases on our on our website, that's thefire.org you'll find evidence that we've defended people on every aspect of every controversial issue, uh, and we're very proud of that. And when it comes to the national landscape uh, about free speech on campus, um, there have been a number of states that have introduced and passed legislation uh, to better protect and ensure that institutions, public institutions of higher education, are protecting the constitutional rights of, of its students and North Dakota just joined a long list of states to do so. So what, what specifically did North Dakota do? I mean, as, as a practical matter, what is this? Because a lot of people are thinking, well, we have the First Amendment, and North Dakota's own constitution also has free speech protections embedded in it. What more do we need? That's a, a fantastic question. One of the things that FIRE does, uh, in, a, in, a, in addition to our defense work, in addition to our uh, litigation and our uh, um, 
efforts to get bills passed in, in different states is that we review written policies at institutions to see whether or not at these public institutions, whether or not they are compliant with what the First Amendment requires. And in North Dakota, while there is the First Amendment to the United States Constitution and a similar provision in the state constitution, uh, we found that there were institutions in the state whose written policies uh, conflict with a longstanding case law within well, that comes from the United States Supreme Court. So what the legislature did is that they took some of these principles and policies set forth by the Supreme Court and codified them in state law. So now universities are told by the legislature on in these varieties of different issues that they need to comply with what the Supreme Court said because it's now codified in state law. So, there, so there's really no excuse anymore to continue to maintain these policies that uh, if enforced would really restrict their students' constitutional rights. We had um, some, in fact, not that long, in a legislative session not that long ago, and I'm trying to remember, was it the 2019 session or 2017? I don't remember, but but we put some of this in statute before, and in fact, the, the language of House Bill 1503 replaces some of that language. What was wrong with what we already had? Did it just didn't go far enough? Yeah, the, the bill that got passed a couple of years ago, what, <clears throat> it was in the 2019 session, was flawed in, in a couple of ways. Um, one way that it was flawed was that it sort of, when it comes to professors' speech in guaranteeing academic freedom and research or, or teaching, um, it basically said, we are going to defer our decisions on academic freedom to the American Association of University Professors, the AUP. Uh, and that is a, that, that is flawed because the state just can't outsource its judgments on academic freedom issues to an outside organization. So we we stripped that clause, and while well intentioned, because you know the AUP has has been a uh, in in a court and also with its 1940 statement on academic freedom has had a, a lot of staying power in protecting the academic freedom rights of professors. Uh, but we wanted to put into state law actual language. Uh, that guarantees these these academic freedom rights instead of outs outsourcing it to an outside organization. Um, and, and so we also cleaned up uh, some, some other issues that we saw in the bill and strengthened it in its number of ways. Uh, added a number of provisions that uh, were omitted from the bill that was signed into the law in, the, in, in 2019 uh, so that student uh, and uh, the university community members' rights to speech on campus are, are more substantially protected. So some of the some of the specific things um, I, I'm reading here from a press release your organization sent out um, adopts the spree, speech protective definition of student on student harassment set forth by the Supreme Court of the United States holding in Davis v. Monroe, which defines student on student mm -hmm. harassment as conduct that is so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively bars a student victim from receiving equal access to education opportunities or benefits. What does that mean? That, that uh, is uh, a, a very uh, lengthy statement, but what that means in essence is that the most common form of restrictive speech policies that we see on college campuses are anti-harassment policies that are overbroad. And overbroad meaning that they prohibit speech that is protected by the First Amendment in their efforts to in their <laughs> efforts to um uh you can I'm get that if you that. want it, i'm sorry <laughs> you can get that if you want yeah i'm sorry that's my work phone <laughs> no, that's okay. um uh so the overbroad uh, the overbroad har harassment um codes prohibit speech that is protected by the constitution in the university's effort to stamp out on actual harassment so by uh codifying this standard that was set forth by the united states supreme court and Davis versus Monroe County Board of Education, the universities will be required to adopt a policy that is um, constitutionally required. Uh, and, and so that will be a, it will allow universities to respond to actual harassment, but also ensure that they do not um, punish speech that is protected by the, by the, uh, by the First Amendment to our constitution. I, I that's that's got to be one of the most challenging areas of of first of first of the first amendment debate is and I I get it all the time because obviously I'm a, I'm a commentator I'm I'm an opinion person I write columns I I I, I broadcast I talk and a lot of a lot of times you hear people say that's harassment or or that's you shouldn't be allowed to say that because 
that makes these other people angry or makes these other people feel bad or or what have you. And it becomes a problem where it's almost I, I don't know if I'm applying this idea right, but like sort of like the like the heckler's veto. Right. Like like this person can't be allowed to talk because these people over here might get upset. And and maybe that that's mm-hmm. even when you talk about like uh, um, like like bringing a, trying to bring a controversial speaker to, to campus and maybe maybe a student group or something invites the speaker to campus. And then um, the excuse is, well, we can't allow this person to speak because these other students might demonstrate or might get upset or might what have you. And it's, that can't be the standard because if that's the standard, then nobody can speak because what do we need the first amendment for if not to protect speech that makes people upset? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, two things here. The first thing, uh, going back to our discussion about harassment, you're right that there is, you know, a sort of colloquial understanding about what what harassment is. We use it, uh, in ways that it, that does not really line up with what the legal standard for harassment is so that's a really good point uh your second point about the headquarters vetoes and um we cannot if we are going to value free speech rights allow you know the least tolerance among us to dictate who can and cannot speak uh on on our college campuses and the bill actually has a provision about security fees for uh for speakers and for student groups who invite speakers in uh one of the things we've seen across the country and actually in written policy at some of the institutions in North Dakota um, that allowed institutions to assess additional fees for speakers that come in if they might have an unpopular viewpoint based on the anticipated reaction of the campus community. And the Supreme Court of the United States uh, basically struck that down in a case called uh, Forsyth, um, where they they basically said that this sort of um, assessment of the security fee based on other people's reaction to the speech amounts to a tax on unpopular viewpoints. And that tax is a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, and, and because that institutions within the state maintain a policy expressly allowing the university to do just that, uh, this bill uh, prohibits institutions from enforcing the, those policies in the future and requires them to adopt a policy uh, that says that if they are going to assess security fees, it has to be done on a viewpoint and content neutral manner. Uh, so they can assess security fees, for example, if the uh, if the you know the organization wants to bring in a speaker and it's going to be in the auditorium and they're expecting 500 people, uh, the university can say, hey, this is what it generally costs to have a, a you know a speaker in the auditorium for 500 people, and that is a viewpoint and content neutral sort of assessment. But when they get into well, we think that you know this might rile people up, we're going to have to hire additional security guards, and you're going to have to pay for it. Uh, that's when it runs afoul of the First Amendment. When we're talking about the state, which which we are in this instance, we're talking about public institutions. So these are these are state institutions, um, you know. And I I I am like like you said, I'm fine with with content neutral. You know, hey, you got to have a security guard or something there, um, and and we're going to apply the same standard to everybody. That's fine. Um, you know, sometimes I I know like like with President Trump, we, we always have the thing like like. Um, when we have high profile political figures come to our state and, you know, President Trump comes and, and all of a sudden, you know, left people are writing, oh, it costs our police this much money, the overtime or whatever to provide security. Or or we have a Democratic candidate, you know, come and, and oh, it costs police this much money and they should have stayed away. And why should taxpayers have to pay for this? And my my thought is, well, if, if we're talking about public institutions and we're talking, I mean, that's. That's kind of the cost of doing business, right? I mean, if we want to have free free speech in this country, then I'm I'm okay with spending some tax to pay your dollars to protect that and say no, this is going to be a venue, and if it makes you mad, you can certainly protest. You can't do illegal things, but you can certainly counter demonstrate. But you know, we're gonna it's gonna maybe cost us some money to allow that. I'm as a conservative, and it gives me hives sometimes to say, oh, let's spend tax dollars, but. This is an area I'm okay spending some tax dollars on. And, you, and you're exactly right about uh, if, if there are uh, – there's a difference between uh, engaging in violent conduct or uh, conduct that is intentionally material and substantially disruptive conduct that sort of prohibits an event from moving forward. Uh, and on the other side, a protected protests. Uh, if you are uh, upset with a candidate or a potential candidate for office or some outside speaker – uh, the Constitution provides you the uh, uh, the ability uh, to or guarantees your ability 
uh, to counter protest those events. You can let your voice be heard uh, outside the event that isn't disruptive. Uh, if there's a Q&A session, uh, going into the event and asking a question during the question and answer session uh, to, to, you know, uh, engage in dialogue and debate to, in, in, these, in these scenarios. And all of those are forms of protected expression by the First Amendment. Um, uh, and and uh, that, that is something we hope to see occurring on these campuses. If a student is, uh, if a student, if one student group invites a speaker that's controversial and another student group lawfully counter protests that speaker and are punished for it, uh, we're, we'll be happy to roll up our sleeves and get to work on their behalf too, uh, because counter protesting is a quintessential uh, form of expression. It, it seems like a lot of times in these debates, there's a lot of pushback from campus administration. And and in fact, here in North Dakota, higher education officials were not supportive of this bill. I have a quote. Um, this is from a uh, this is from back in March. This is Lisa Johnson, who uh, was the vice chancellor for academic and student affairs with the North Dakota University System. She said, I quote, despite the fact that our campuses have not encountered any substantiated cases of restrictions being placed on free speech have had no speakers shouted down, no visitors assaulted, no disinvited speakers, and no student complaints for at least the last 12 years, which is remarkable in the current political environment. There are still external forces that continue to perpetuate the notion that North Dakota colleges and universities are actively working against free speech and freedom of expression. While that may be true of certain coastal institutions, this simply this is simply not true of NDUS institutions. So when she's talking about external, I don't know if she's talking about your group, but what's your reaction when you hear that? Well, um, it is not surprising uh, that a university administrator or a group of administrators might oppose legislative uh, action in this space. It, require, it requires the universities to do things that they weren't already doing. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, uh, the universities uh, had on the books unconstitutional policies about uh, assessing security fees uh, for unpopular uh, speakers. It, uh, their written policies uh, on harassment, as another example, did not comply with the, uh, uh, not a single institution fully complied with the uh, Davis standard, as we talked about earlier. Um, and so while there may not be official reports to the institution about, or any institution about uh, these issues, the fact that they maintain these, these um, unconstitutional policies uh, showed that there was need for the legislature to intervene here to require them to adopt specific policies. And uh, I think that the students within the North Dakota system will be better served by these more uh, speech protective policies. I, it's it's and also I I think there's something a little bit facetious about the argument that it's not happening therefore we don't need the protections and, and that, that to me that supposes and I, I I generally understand the idea if it, if it's not broke don't fix it or let's not let's not just make laws for the sake of making law but when we're talking about something as foundational to our society as free speech. I don't think we should have to wait around for somebody to get censored or somebody to get shouted down or or somebody to, to you know some some speaker to get canceled because before we act right why do we have to wait for that to happen before we put in place protections I don't think we have to no I I think that 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 was going to be my second point and a very good one you made uh, having these speech protective policies in place may prevent these these events from happening in the future and giving the universities sort of a a blueprint for how they can and cannot respond to these events moving forward is uh, particularly important. Uh, and uh, the legislature letting the universities know, hey, we have our eye on you. We want to ensure that our universities are a place that value free expression is also, is also uh, an important tool that the legislature has to ensure that the agencies under its control um, are not violating core constitutional freedoms. Do you feel, uh, zooming out from North Dakota a little bit, do you feel like the, like the free speech to me, it's because I've been I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and it seemed early on you talked about free speech and you got a lot of people to agree to grudgingly mm -hmm. say, because, listen, we've all been in that moment where somebody's just saying something and you're like, I wish that guy would just shut up. Right. I, everybody's been there. Politics are frustrating. We all care about this stuff and we're all human beings. I understand the impulse, but you could usually persuade people and saying, well, then just change the channel or walk away or or organize a counter protest or, 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 a, or, a, or a thing of your own to, to share your own point of view. 
I, you know, I think people were more accepting of that. It seems to me, and as somebody who's who's actively engaged in the free speech movement, employed by the free speech movement, uh, do you do you feel like that argument's harder to make? I feel like people are less are less accepting of the free speech defense of controversial expression these days. I think that uh, surveys on uh, some student attitudes, particularly if we're talking about younger people, um, student attitudes towards free speech is changing. Um, a lot of them, the, if you ask the, the first question in some of our surveys, uh, and if, you're, if your listeners and viewers are interested, they can view some of our uh, surveys and reporting on this at uh, thefire.org. Uh, you'll see that if you ask like the baseline question, do you believe in free speech? Overwhelmingly, people will say yes. And it's when you start, you know, asking deeper questions and sort of digging down and asking, well, do you do you support somebody's right to uh, speech that might offend somebody? Well, then that goes down drastically. That support among younger people in particular goes down drastically. Um, while uh, and so I think that there is a sort of a cultural shift happening right now, particularly among younger people, that um, it is more difficult, I think, to to have these conversations about why defending speech, even speech that you might find repugnant, uh, is, is worthwhile. And uh, so I think that in addition to, uh, and that, uh, as you as you know, is a very different issue, that these cultural issues are, are different than uh, legislative, uh, you know, policy issues that are that we're that we're discussing today. Um, we are, uh, we've seen across the country, uh, bipartisan support for a lot of these bills that protect speech rights on campus. Um, in some cases, bills, sim bills similar to this have gotten unanimous or near unanimous votes in either or both chambers of a legislature. And uh, that, it, that, that is really heartening. Uh, however, if we are losing a, an, enti an entire generation uh, where their support for um, free speech when it comes to unpopular or um, speech that they might think is you know, hateful or, or, or just wrongheaded even, uh, that's when it is, uh, that's where I see right now to be a, a particularly worrisome trend uh, and um, it, there are there are not a whole lot of easy answers to to that broader cultural issue. Why do you think the trend's happening? And, and again, as somebody, I mean, fire is is very sharply focused on on campuses. And mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to say that college campuses are are where this is happening, but like you said, it is a, it is a a shift I think with a younger generation. So maybe you know, obviously that's campuses are a younger generation and maybe it's just most uh, a very visible place in our society mm -hmm. for it to be happening so i don't want to make it sound like like higher education is although high i, I think sometimes there are problems there that, that, that it's some uniquely problematic area because not and i i believe in higher education and support higher education all of those caveats but why do you think this is happening like what's driving this trend well, there are a lot of theories out there as to as to why this is happening. Uh, I'm a, I'm a lawyer first. I am not a psychologist or a sociologist. I, I am not well versed uh, enough to be able to provide uh, a really detailed analysis for why this may be happening. Uh, Fire's president and CEO Greg Lukianoff co-authored a book a couple of years ago uh, with a social psychologist and professor at NYU Stern School of Business, uh, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, and uh, Greg and John put out a book a couple years ago called The Coddling of the American Mind as a follow-up to an article they had written that was a cover story in The Atlantic Magazine in 2015. Uh, and in that book, uh, Greg, with his free speech background and John and his social psychology background, explore some of these areas. And I would really uh, strongly encourage uh, your uh, viewers and listeners to uh, to check out that book. I think they they have a new version with the new forward uh, uh, and uh, in paperback form. So um, if your viewers are interested in these in these broader cultural issues, I, I, I can't recommend that book strongly enough. I know uh, it sounds like I might be uh, shilling for my for my boss a little <laughs> bit here, but I, I think that there are a lot of really great insights in that book that are a little bit outside of my primary expertise. Well, I, I can uh, I haven't read the book specifically, but I have followed your bosses and your organization's uh, efforts for a long time. And they're they're certainly certainly worthy. And, and like you said, not 
not um, free speech is not a partisan or an ideological issue, unless unless you think liberty is an ideology, which it's I don't I don't think that it is. I think it transcends <laughs> ideology. Sure. I, I I think fundamentally, first and foremost, you can't have ideology and you can't have ideological debates if people can't express themselves freely without fear of recrimination or suppression or what have you. Um, so that's that's you know where we're at as a society, and maybe there's a lot of things we could talk about about why American minds are are feeling coddled, but that's probably a little bit outside of our scope of our interview today. Maybe maybe a, a topic for another live stream. Tyler, thank you so much for your work on this. Happy to see this become law. Um, I think our campuses uh, – and, and again, I don't necessarily agree with Vice Chancellor Johnson when she says that North Dakota hasn't had a lot of problems. I, I, I think I could agree with that. At least I'm not aware of a lot of problems. Um, but – I don't think we should have to wait for there to be a problem before we put in place protection. So I'm glad we did. Tyler, thanks for your time. Last word. Oh, Rob, uh, thank you so much for, for having me on the show. This, this conversation was uh, really uh, interesting for me. I'm glad I was able to answer some questions for you all. If uh, you or any of your viewers and listeners have further questions, uh, they can feel free uh, um, uh, to reach out to me directly. Uh, they can, they can get me at Tyler at the and I'd be happy to answer any of their questions. Thank you, Tyler.